coming from, we're seeing that we're coming from all over the world. So um, we're, we're excited to uh, get started on the, the plenary to um, continue on the workshop from the great, great discussion and great presentation we just had. So uh, my name is Chris Clavin. Uh, I'm a researcher at the National Institute of Standards and Technologies Community Resilience Program. Um, I also serve on the, Nash, the, the forthcoming National Climate Assessment, which we'll be talking a little bit more about today, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this session, um, Global to Local, Assessing and Addressing Changing Climates. Um, so first, before we get going about what we're talking about, I just, on behalf of the panel, thank you, thank you, thank you to Lori Peak uh, for your guidance and your knowledge and your background, and your kindness as we try to figure this out as well too, um, for helping us figure out how we could be responsive and um, make sure our work is responsive and is relevant to everyone here in the workshop. So thank you for that. Jennifer Tobin and all the team at the center as well too, thank you for helping make this session happen and our workshop happen again. We're looking forward to seeing you all in person, we hope next year. Um, and I just wanna also extend a brief thank you to Jennifer Helgeson, my colleague at the NIST Community Resilience Program and Reed Sherman, my other colleague at the US Global Change Research Program for helping us conceptualize this session, um, organize it and uh, turn this into reality. Okay, so for this, this year's theme, Changing Climates, Equity and Adaptation in a Warming World, um, challenges all of us to think about our work and questions like, this is verbatim from, from the center, who has the power and authority to drive climate change mitigation and adaptation? So the who of that. And then to us in this session, at least things I think about are, how do we understand and document the effects of climate change um, and those who are, who are impacted by that? And then how do we design the processes and the who we involve in those processes to under, undertake and document and then deliver this knowledge? And so, as we were thinking about that, those questions, I think, formed the basis for, I think, the discussion that I hope we've put together for all of you today. So I'll introduce the panelists in a minute. Uh, our panelists are responsible for developing or translating the results of scientific climate change assessments at a variety of different scales. We'll talk about international scale today to national scale down to the state scale from the state of California. Um, and as all of you at the center have challenged us, one of the most important responsibilities, and this is speaking to myself and our panel, we have is to ensure the processes we design to conduct these assessments and ensure that the use of these assessments both include and are responsive to those that are disproportionately impacted um, by climate change. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we put together a panel, and I know um, the panelists are very excited as well too, to uh, share a little bit about our work um, both um, from the federal agency perspective and the perspective of conducting various scientific assessments to understand and document the impacts of climate change, and also to share some opportunities uh, for each of the respective programs our, our panelists come from, perhaps some opportunities for the workshop community to engage in the future as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to do a quick introduction of who we have today. Uh, so our first speaker will be Victoria Salinas from FEMA, uh, Bill Selecki from Hunter College, City University of New York, Allison Crimmins, who comes to us from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, uh, Neil Makuda from the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and John Balbus from um, the Department of Health and Human Services. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing, Jennifer, um, and let me, while you're queuing up Victoria's presentation. So uh, Victoria could not be with us today, but we're still excited to have her voice and her message with us. She recorded some uh, some comments from us. So before we start that, uh, let me introduce Victoria. Victoria Salinas currently serves as FEMA, uh, at FEMA as the Acting Deputy Administration for FEMA Resilience. Uh, FEMA Resilience aims to help communities across the nation equitably adapt, survive, recover, and thrive in the face of natural disasters, climate change, and security threats. Uh, Victoria previously served as the Vice President for Programs and Communication at the nonprofit Fuse Corps, and she also served uh, as the Chief Resilience Officer and Deputy City Minister uh, for the City of Oakland, California. So, I, uh, Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you to go ahead and start the presentation, please. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Center in the U.S. Global Change Research Program for inviting me to speak, and a special thanks to Deputy Director Sarah Abdelrahim 
who is on loan to USG CRP from FEMA Resilience. Many people think about FEMA as a federal agency that helps with disaster response and recovery. However, our mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters, and our vision is one of a prepared and resilient nation. As the climate crisis escalates around the globe and in our own backyards, we are being asked to reimagine how we reduce risk and fuel a greener future. I'm Victoria Salinas, FEMA's Acting Deputy Administrator for Resilience, and I'm thrilled to join you today to share how we at FEMA are reimagining the future and the partnerships we need with you to realize the possibilities for change. So here are three things we are doing. First, we are making equity the cornerstone of resilience. Widening inequality is a global issue, but one that requires inter interconnected action at all levels. Prior to coming to FEMA, I worked at the local level, serving as a chief resilience officer for the city of Oakland, California, and later for the national nonprofit Fuse Corps, working with cities and counties across the country to address their most pressing challenges. It is no secret that racial and socioeconomic disparity permeates every aspect of American life. And as climate change increases the frequency and duration of natural disasters, these disparities will continue to magnify, making recovery more costly and time consuming for many of our nation's disadvantaged communities. Jurisdictions across the country are actively working to advance equity and address the impacts of our nation's discriminatory history, including housing and land use planning policies that have in effect created a situation in which the color of your skin, your family's income, and your zip code of origin are predictive of your life outcomes and how quickly you'll recover after disaster. We often see the impact of this inequity most starkly after disasters. In 2018, Rice University and, and University of Pittsburgh released a study, Damage is Done, the Longitudinal Impacts of Natural Hazards on Wealth Inequality in the U.S. It argues that there is inherent bias in flood disaster recovery that results in recovery programs having the unintended consequence of widening the wealth gap. Specifically, it demonstrates that after a natural disaster, whites accumulate wealth while people of color lose it. White communities affected badly by disasters, which was about 10 billion in damages in their study, gained an average of 126,000 in wealth following the disaster and through the recovery efforts. For Blacks, Latinx, and Asians living in, in counties hit hard by natural disasters, these communities saw their wealth decrease by an amount of between $10,000 and $29,000. The root of the issues identified was that it, recovery is often dependent on the ability to rebuild a home or reopen a business. And, and in low-income communities, for instance, where there may be more renters than owners, people are not recovering as quickly. This only further increases existing disparities in wealth. I share this example with you because what we do before disasters will have the greatest impact on community resilience. National governments have a vital role to play in creating the conducive environment for building individual community and national resilience. The Biden-Harris administration has made tackling the climate crisis and advancing equity major pillars of all our work. At FEMA, we're instilling equity as the foundation of emergency management and reimagining what it means to help our, most nation, our nation's most underserved and disadvantaged communities build resilience. We are evaluating our own programs and changing our methods of delivery to increase participation of underserved communities. Our resilience investment programs are part of the Biden-Harris administration's Justice 40 initiative, where 40% of benefits must go to disadvantaged communities. Often coming up with a local match to federal funds is a barrier for disadvantaged communities. We've got COVID HMGP, flood mitigation assistance, the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant, all of these programs that are part of a resilience portfolio include changes to cost share requirements to make it easier for economically disadvantaged rural communities and other communities with high social vulnerability to leverage these important federal funds. Conducting a benefit cost analysis can also be a hurdle for other communities because of the technical expertise required and the cost of hiring consultants to help you. And so for communities with high social vulnerability, we're providing more hands-on support with this grant requirement so that it's not a barrier to entry. For our BRIC program, we also offer direct technical assistance, which has been a two-page application made really easy so that communities can truly ask for what they need. These are all examples of the equity-centered approach to emergency management that is being integrated into all of our policies and programs as we seek to make sure that everyone is able to benefit and everyone is able to invest in their resilience. Second, Climate resilience will also require hyper-local solutions, solutions that will need to address multiple types of hazards at one time and yield multiple benefits to surrounding communities. 
This means project approaches that tackle one peril, one hazard, without creating benefits for the whole community need to be increasingly left in the past. Communities are interconnected. Disasters have cascading consequences. For instance, we know that in some areas, particularly on the West Coast, flood follows fire. We've seen numerous examples where light rainfalls can cause flooding and mud flow from burned vegetation and soil. Coastal flooding and saltwater intrusion can make already fragile infrastructure more vulnerable to other hazards. However, solutions designed with co-benefits in mind can reduce multiple types of risk at a time. This requires more localized targeted approaches to community planning and designing and implementing projects benefiting the whole community rather than certain segments of society. For example, nature-based solutions can include strategies such as creating green space and strengthening green infrastructure that can help communities tackle extreme heat, stormwater management, and flood control, as well as contribute to better health, health outcomes for nearby residents through reduced air pollution and access to places to recreate. These strategies can be challenging and may take a little longer, but more people will benefit. They will also will require more partnerships because transformational projects often require a diverse array of capital, grants, and investments to make a reality. Here's another example for you. Many of you are familiar with FEMA's Flood Mitigation Assistance Program. It's helped NFIP policyholders elevate homes around the country. It can also be used for neighborhood-based resilience solutions. FEMA can now offer 90-10 cost share to all our projects where it's serving a community with a high social vulnerability of 0.5 or higher, according to the CDC index. This includes many types of localized flood resist, resist reduction projects, flood water storage and diversion, fire retention ponds, bioswales, surface grading, stormwater management, culverts, catch basins, green infrastructure, investing in pervious surfaces, floodplain and wetland marsh and riverine and coastal restoration management. All of these types of things can be funded through these neighborhood and ecosystem-based projects of FMA. But they can take more time to plan, to bring people together, to make sure that it's meeting communities' needs, and that the partnerships are in place to make sure that these projects are being applied for and then implemented. So here's my charge to you. How can you partner with communities to advance systemic solutions, transformational solutions to climate change? At FEMA, our portfolio of risk reduction and resilience invest investments also includes a broad range of grants and capacity building programs. I'm going to touch on them briefly because I want to highlight your role in much of this as well. Great projects usually don't have one funding stream. They are funded through diverse capital stacks, but that requires that as resilience builders, we need to know how to leverage them. At FEMA, we've got Homeland Security grants that cover everything from preparedness activities to helping communities build those response capabilities useful after any extreme event. Last year, this year, it was about a billion dollars that we put out. We have a regional catastrophic planning grant that can fund community resiliency planning and housing resilience planning. We've got the BRIC program that I already mentioned. It also has the direct technical assistance, FMA that I mentioned. We've also got new programs such as the STORM Act, which will be a revolving loan fund, our dam safety program that had about $50 million recently put out. These are all types of programs just at FEMA. But if you go on the White House website for the bipartisan infrastructure law, you'll also find resources for state and local governments with hundreds of pages of new grants and programs. The conclusion here is that resources are available to invest in climate resilience. However, communities will need help. They'll need partners. They'll need people like you to help them build lasting capacity support community-driven planning that results in those transformational projects and approaches that will help them invest in their resilience. It is in this resilience building space where we can do the most to address systemic inequities that drive vulnerability and disparate outcomes for vulnerable populations. But together, we can make equity the foundation. We can pursue multi-hazard, multi-benefit solutions. We can dismantle the impacts of systemic bias in our society. And I challenge each of you to consider the work you're doing through the lens of equity, to examine the programs and policies, how they are implemented, who is benefiting, and how data-driven decisions can really help you drive more equitable outcomes. I also want to thank you, USGCRP, and the many of you in the audience today who've been longstanding partners of FEMA and supporters of the Resilient Nations Partnership Network. 
This is a whole community network with more than 1,500 organizations represented in. Federal, state, nonprofits, private sector representatives. Many of you also contributed to the recently released Building Alliances for Climate Action resource. This resource provides partners' perspectives, personal stories of climate resilience, insights, and resources that the whole community can use to address the effects of climate change. And working alongside many of you, we've been thrilled to support the development of the fifth National Climate Assessment. Through today's session and those to come, I look forward to seizing more opportunities for mutual support and partnership. I want to encourage each of you to take this more people-centered approach to building resilience. Together, we can do this. We can promote resiliency and more equitable outcomes that protect all communities from the devastating effects of climate change. Again, thank you for having me today. Thanks, Jennifer, for playing that for us. So that, that was that was outstanding. Um, rather than reflect, I'm just going to keep going. What I think, but our next our next our next panelist will have even more to share about. Uh, I think the reflection of that, and hopefully, Victoria's comments spoke to I think a lot of us uh, in in the workshop community as well. So um, one thing I forgot to mention before we came on is about questions and answers. So we do want to hear your questions. Um, as thank you, Mufti, as Mufti said in the chat. Please put your questions in the Zoom chat um, as opposed to the feed loop platform. Um, I've asked, I've encouraged the, the panelists to feel free to engage. Feel free to also engage among yourselves on the chat uh, as well, too. But we're going to hold the panel, uh, the full panel discussion and QA to the end um, when we'll uh, get to as many of your questions as we can. So please drop those in the chat. Okay. Uh, uh, our next speaker is Bill Selecki. Uh, Bill is a professor at a professor of geography at Hunter College uh, of the City University of New York, where his work focuses on urban environmental change, resilience, and adaptation transitions. He served on the U.S. National Climate Assessment and on the International Panel on Climate Change's Working Group for Impacts, Adaptation, and Vulnerability for both the fifth and sixth assessment reports, which he'll be speaking to us a bit today about. Uh, so. Bill, I will turn it over to you. Feel free to share your screen if that's working. Great. Can you guys hear me okay? Hopefully. We hear you uh, great. And if my uh, internet's great, uh, if my internet starts to get a little wobbly, I'll go off, uh, I'll go off video. Um, but uh, um, here are my slides. Okay, you should be able to see them. Okay. As, looks looks yeah. great now. Excellent. So as, as uh, Chris mentioned, I'm, I'm going to be Reflecting a little bit on this most recent report that I was involved with, this is the um, IPCC Working Group 2 report. Um, so as you probably know, there are three reports that come out, uh, one on science, the uh, climate, um, quote unquote, science or sort of um, physical science base. Um, working Group 2, more on the social science, impacts, adaptation, vulnerability questions, and Working Group 3, looking at questions of mitigation, climate mitigation. Um, but at first, I want to just uh, thank uh, Lori and, and the organizers for putting this together. This is really exciting. I was thinking back, I think my first um, hazards workshop was 1987. Sounds like a long time ago, 35 years, I realized. Um, so it's always great to, to sort of chat and engage with, uh, with uh, um, folks I've always been connected with. So what I want to do is just sort of reflect a little bit on some of the issues that were raised in the report um, and picking up on some of the things that Victoria really mentioned about uh, issues of equity, which really came out quite strong here as well, and sort of how it uh, wraps into the larger discussions of, of what was going on with respect to the results of the report. And I think, um, you know, one of the main sort of highlighting uh, flag statements coming from this assessment, you know, again, sort of furthering issues that have been brought in, in other uh, IPC assessments, the scientific evidence is unequivocal, climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet, right? Um, and then any further delay in, in uh, concerted global action will miss a brief and rapidly closing window to secure a livable uh, world. And so, you know, this is sort of this idea that we have great challenges, but also there's opportunities. There's this window of opportunity, um, which the report tries to highlight in some of the, the idea of solution spaces is really a, a main thread. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some of these impact issues. Uh, the report kind of highlighted um, uh, you know, a range of, of different types of impacts. And I think one of the things that, you know, as a general statement, you know, it provides a sort of advanced understanding of, of climate change driven impacts. Uh, it talks about specific impacts on the world's ecosystems and societies. 
I think, you know, more forcefully, it sort of states that climate change at national and global scales is not something that could be ignored, is not going away, and its impacts will become increasingly uh, worse over time. And some of these um, particular impacts, as, as you probably know, the architecture of the report is into diff different chapters, but some of the things that sort of bubbled up into the summary for policymakers, issues of heat stress, um, water security or water scarcity issues, food security, um, and then also flood risk. There are, of course, many other sort of in intersecting elements, which I'll talk about uh, in, in a moment as well. With respect to North America, I just sort of brought out a few things. Uh, remembering there isn't a US chapter, there's a North America, which in this context is sort of Canada and US. Uh, climate change will neg has negatively impacted human health and well being. Food production in the region is already increasingly affected by climate change. Extreme events and climate hazards are adversely affecting economic activities across the US and Canada have, and has a, have disrupted supply chain, infrastructure, and trade. North American cities and settlements have been have been impacted by increasingly severe and frequent climate hazards and extreme events, which have contributed to infrastructure damage, livelihood losses, damage to heritage resources and safety, um, safety concerns. Terrestrial marine and freshwater ecosystems are also being profoundly altered by the climate, climate change across the region. Um, the, the report also sort of looks into the future you know, into the in, into uh, mid-century, and then also some opportunities for uh, for adaptation. Again, I'll highlight as well. I think one of the other kind of key threads that that came out in the report is a recognition. You know, and this is obviously a, a long emerging theme and thread that climate change kind of interconnects with all the other things that we know going on, um, and that these in turn, you know, become a range of cascading or, co or compounding issues. Right. So climate change combines with unsustainable use of natural resources, habitat destruction, growing urbanization, and inequity, um, and that in general, um, some of this this the issue of ad of adaptation is um, is is generally uh, limited. Uh, it also sort of brings forward uh, more specifically the idea of, of compound risks. I know, I think uh, Victoria mentioned the issue of cascading risks. So this, this interplay, uh, this crucial interplay between climate change and, and all the other things, not only sort of multiple uh, climate impacts simultaneously, but other sort of societal challenges that, that we see uh, moving forward. And this is just a quick uh, a diorama or, or sort of schematic of some of these interactions of how uh, heat stress both affects the ecosystem as well as the social system and the, the interplay between that, um, uh, creating uh, productivity re reductions, but also livelihood loss as well. So given all that, what's the good news and what's the bad news specifically with respect to adaptation, right? So the good news is that you know, more and more adaptation is now being, uh, you know, experimented, presented, being planned, developed, um, and, and implemented. There's a range of different sort of pilot projects and, and experiments that are going on, looking at the connection with, with uh, various infrastructural, te technological, um, societal, and uh, ecosystem-based uh, adaptation, which is really providing a basis for improvement and scaling up of, of adaptation strategies that we see not only in North America, but, but globally. The report also goes a long way in starting to talk about some of the social science questions with respect to adaptation and the enabling conditions that seem to be fostering adaptation and, and what, what those are, particularly high, highlighting things like good governance, um, the availability of finance, um, knowledge, access to knowledge, cutting edge knowledge, and of course, equity, right? The, there's also a set of bad news issues that are emerged with this. Uh, the, the, the idea of the adaptation gap is quite clear, that the scale of adaptation is really not sufficient to meet the challenge of, of climate change. We see that both locally and at the global scale. We also sort of recognize that in some cases, adaptation is leading to maladaptation. And this is both in the context of mitigation. So, you know, simple things like air, air conditioners, you know, for heat stress, of course, driving uh, increased emissions, but there are also a range of other sort of you know, within the, the adaptation bucket, uh, more maladaptation examples, and these need to be sort of understood and cataloged and potentially avoided. There's also a real lack of coordination, monitoring, and evaluation of most adaptation uh, uh, strategies put into place. This is really very much uh, underdeveloped, both globally um, and in, in other contexts. 
And I think most profoundly in some cases that some of the adaptation approaches that we're planning and are being implemented are losing their effectiveness simply because of the rate of climate change itself. So we are really sort of in this sort of conundrum where we're tr truly not moving fast enough at the global scale um, and in many, many sort of regional scales, which I could highlight um, as well. And this is sort of uh, burdening that, that adaptation gap. And in many cases, the uh, lower income populations are most uh, at risk. Um, just to highlighting some of the examples that come, came out of the report, fixed versus flexible adaptation. Um, I could sort of speak to this a little bit in Q&A if people want. But let me just sort of, you know, um, in my remaining minutes sort of tail or, or, or tag specifically into this issue of accelerating adaptation. What are some of these solution space ideas that come out of the assessment? So one of the things that people um, that is sort of uh, universal across the, uh, the document is the idea of, of uh, focused political commitment, follow on through and integration across all scales of governance is really being quite profound. The idea of having a clear institutional framework to promote adaptation, clear goals, priorities, defining responsibilities also are seen uh, with uh, aspects of accelerating adaptation. Enhancing knowledge of impacts and risks also improve. Uh, improve responses. So getting that information out and engaging with, with the potential impacted parties. And evaluation and monitoring are all es essential to sort of track the progress. And one of the key elements in this is also this idea of focus on equity and justice. And I'll just sort of turn to this thing more specifically um, here for a moment as well. You know, we've heard many, many times, and Victoria sort of mentioned this as well, the importance of equity and justice in the process of adaptation, as well as in, in, in vulnerability. And so what the report really does, it positions equity and justice at this sort of global scale as being front and center to climate action. And I think the, the critical thing for us is that this is, isn't just sort of a moral question or sort of a moral position that this is sort of the right thing to do. There's in clear um, assessed evidence that adaptation actions that are most effective are most effective when the progress, when the process is inclusive, transparent, and cogenerative. I mean, and so it's just, it, uh, this is sort of one of the, the headline statements, at least for me, that comes out of the, the, the assessment process. And that the equity and justice in the adaptation process can be promoted through a range of different mechanisms, addressing the limits to adaptation and enhancing in, or, or, or removing those, particularly obviously the soft limits as they're defined, enabling, promoting enabling conditions and building more flexible adaptation. Um, so just a couple of other things as, as I end off here, think other things that you know, enhance opportunities for, for adaptation. Um, I've already mentioned advancing enabling conditions that knowledge and, and governance uh, and equity particularly. Um, focus on synergies and co-benefits of, of these processes and sort of promote those. Develop a, a robust monitoring and evaluation capacity critical to sort of assessing um, whether or not these, these uh, strategies that we're developing are really moving the needle. Incorporate climate action into the everyday process. It's obviously not siloed, but really integrated throughout the governance or other sort of operations. Prepare for stresses and shocks and take advantage of them. And I think there's a lot of discussion about, particularly in this community, about how best to sort of understand these extreme events, what we can learn from them and take advantage of those opportunities that emerge, those policy windows that emerge from them. Uh, develop a flexible and, a, and a, an adaptive and a diverse portfolio of strategies. Again, really emerging from, we looked at, you know, tens of thousands of documents of reports and so forth. And these are some of the high level statements. The other thing that the report also spoke to is the idea of climate resilient development. And I'll just end off with this, um, but the idea to recognize that any good adaptation strategy for climate change also needs to be directly interconnected with uh, climate mitigation in the context of sustainable development. And so this sort of notion of blending these these two themes together and climate resilient development really emerged you know, in the latter parts of the report and in the summary for policymakers as a really focused way to sort of address some of these simultaneous uh, challenges of adaptation mitigation in the context of sustainable development. I'm not gonna speak a lot to that question. I could again, highlight it more, but it's also an approach that really you know, prioritizes the role of engagement, um, uh, partnership and, and in, in turn equity and justice. Um, and there's, there's multiple pathways. This is from the report, a very challenging graphic that was actually put into the report about these notions of pathways. The green ones toward the top illustrate higher opportunities for um, uh, climate resilient development. The ones toward the bottom, um, uh, less so and more problematic. And I'll just end off with um, 
um, just a, 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 a nod to, uh, to cities and so forth, being a cities guy. Um, you know, we recognize globally, we are rapidly moving into a very vastly dominated urban landscape. And of course, in the US context, about 80% of people live in cities. So one of the things that came out of the report as well is that cities really have an over, oversized role to play in this, both in terms of a, a range of different opportunities to reduce uh, vulnerability, but also enhance adaptation to climate change and also uh, enter into this discussion of climate resilient development. So with that, I, I want to uh, pause here. I hope I didn't take too much more beyond what I was designed to do and pass it back to you, Chris. Thank you, Bill. Uh, not only your comments are great, but your ability to can time was fantastic. So excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just going to keep us moving then. So uh, next up is we, we have Allison Crimmins. Um, Allison is the director of the U.S. National Climate Assessment for the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Uh, and in her role, she's part of the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. She also serves as the vice chair uh, for the steering committee that oversees the first national nature assessment as well. Uh, Allison's a climate scientist with expertise in assessing domestic and international climate impacts mitigation and mitigation benefits uh, with a particular focus on health and economic damages. So Allison, thank you. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I am coming to you today, as Chris mentioned, from the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. Uh, that is the acronym you may have heard in Victoria's opening remarks. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, so I thought I'd start with a little uh, explanation of, of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. We were codified just after Bill's first natural uh, hazards workshop in 1990 under the Global Change Research Act. And the 13 federal member agencies of the USGCRP are tasked with uh, coordinating climate change research across the federal government and providing that information to decision makers uh, who are facing risk management questions under a changing climate. And one of the most important ways, in my opinion, uh, in which we do this is through the National Climate Assessment or NCA. To date, the USGCRP has published four national climate assessments. We are now in the process of developing the fifth one, NCA5, which is expected to be released by the end of 2023. Uh, most of my talk today is gonna be zooming you in from the international level to the national level uh, and talking about NCA5 but I also wanted to just briefly mention some of our other projects that lend to an idea of a sustained assessment process. So in addition to the national climate assessments, we have developed uh, multiple special reports, which allow us to focus uh, on specific priority topics in more depth. So I've put some examples on this slide. We have uh, the food security report that came out in 2015, the climate and health report in 2016, the first volume of NCA4, which was a deep dive into the physical science uh, basis, was released in 2017. And then the second state of the climate cycle report was released um, at the same time as the second volume of NCA4 in 2018. And beyond those special reports, there are many, many other projects that uh, the US Global Change Research Program members work on that feed into a sustained assessment framework. There's a large network of federal and regional resources and tools, and many of these are tailored to providing uh, scientific information in a way that is helpful for decision makers. Uh, so that's sort of our, our broader mandate, but let me zoom back into the National Climate Assessment. So the Global Change Research Act instructs the US Global Change Research Program to assess the observed and projected impacts of climate change on the United States, to synthesize, evaluate, and interpret scientific research. In the second item listed here on the screen, you'll see that the act specifically calls out uh, a number of topics that must be covered in the national climate assessments. Uh, you'll recognize some of those when I get to the table of contents. And the National Climate Assessment is also tasked with looking at what climate changes have happened or are happening around us right now, as well as projections of risk into the future. And uh, we're tasked with looking across time scales from our lifetime to our children's and our grandchildren's lifetime. Many of the authors who write this uh, report are scientists and researchers. 
But unlike a typical journal article, they are not being asked to conduct original research for the National Climate Assessment. They are tasked with looking across all the information sources and weighing what is important, uh, what we know, what, uh, what rises to be included within their chapter and what doesn't. Uh, and then more than just a literature review, the author teams must then come to a consensus on how confident we are in those findings and how likely those impacts will be under different scenarios. So by reporting not just what the impacts are, but how confident we are in them, uh, how likely they are to occur, an assessment is a risk management tool that can inform actions or policy. However, it does not prescribe or advocate for any specific policy. So the National Climate Assessment is policy relevant and policy neutral. Uh, I will just quickly touch on our table of contents here because it's pretty big. Uh, in, if you start all the way to the left, you'll see the second and the third chapter there are our physical science chapters. The rest of that first column and the second column are our national level chapters. And so those look at the impacts of climate change on a sector or a group of people uh, at a national scale. Uh, I'll also flag for you that uh, our table of contents includes two new chapters, new to NCA5, uh, which are the economics and the human social systems chapters. Uh, the third bin on the screen here are our regional chapters. So there's 10 USGCRP regions, and those chapters cover the breadth of all of the impacts in all of the sectors, but focused on a regional state uh, and local level. And then finally, we have our two response chapters, adaptation and mitigation. I also flagged in blue here, uh, we have another uh, new feature to NCA5, these five short features um, uh, called focus on boxes, which were nominated by the authors of NCA5. And uh, those are on topics that span multiple chapters and are being written collaboratively by authors across multiple chapters. Um, so a, a really nice opportunity to sort of pull together pieces from different parts of the report uh, into some timely uh, uh, text boxes. So uh, on top of our congressional mandate and the principles behind all of our assessments, we also have some priorities for NCA5. Uh, they are the five priorities listed here. I'll just touch on them briefly. We want to uh, build on but not repeat the bedrock of authoritative science that was established in previous assessments. Uh, so we're going to be focusing on what is new and where the science has advanced since NCA4. We want to improve the accessibility of climate science to a broader audience. Uh, we are encouraging our authors to be creative in their communications. So thinking about ways to leverage the power of art and storytelling to better communicate the climate science people need to act. Uh, we want to make this report about people. So we are gathering diverse voices and perspectives to improve the relevance of the information we're delivering. And finally, we don't want this to just be a book on a shelf that's gathering dust. We want to make sure that NCA5 is useful and usable. So we don't want to just better describe the problem. We want to provide the valuable context people need to make risk management choices. So as we are developing NCA5, we are also um, always looking for ways to improve our development process and expand efforts to be inclusive and representative. So that means thinking about um, a, a couple different bins here who participates in NCA, uh, who is most at risk, who engages in our development process, and who is able to access and use the information we publish. So I'm gonna to touch on the first two items here, and then my last two slides, I'll, I'll talk about the engagement and, and use of national climate assessments. So we know that diversity in author teams directly address the goals for NCA5. Uh, and that an inclusive culture leads to better science and better assessments. So we've put a lot of thought into how we select authors and, uh, and working to improve diversity in the NCA contributors themselves. We have more than 450 authors and more than 100 technical contributors. These authors have a really wide range of subject matter expertise and work experience. They span career stages from students to retired, 
And many of them, uh, about two thirds of our authors are completely new to the assessment process. We also have uh, 48 states represented in NCA5 authorship. We're missing uh, Alabama and Arkansas, so maybe next time. Uh, we have Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Guam, and Palau. And so we've got some really good geographic coverage, uh, which is important because uh, you wanna make sure that uh, the varying climate impacts happening all around our country are well represented uh, in the assessment. Having a, uh, a diverse team of authors also helps us make sure that what we are writing about, the content of the report, speaks to more people and can be used by more people. So one of the ways um, we think about this question of who is most at risk is by using a risk-based framework. And that means instead of starting with emissions leads to radiative forcing, leads to temperature change, leads to sea level rise, leads to coastal flooding, the, the authors of this report are asked to start with what people care about first. Flooded basements, uh, impacts on their communities, costly damage to infrastructure. So we're, we're asking the authors to start with the so what and explain how climate change is threatening those things that we value and then identify where people uh, are already taking action to address those threats. So let me wrap up quickly with who engages and who can access the report. Uh, we need robust public engagement to make sure we're writing a report that speaks to the things people care about uh, and are most concerned about. So we amped up our public engagement for NCA5. We put out our annotated outlines for public comment earlier this year. Uh, so people could inform the scope and the approach of the chapters before a lot of the text was already baked in. And we hosted 34 public engagement workshops where participants could speak directly to the authors about the things they care about most and how to make this report more useful to them. Uh, looking ahead to this fall, we have a really important public engagement opportunity coming up. And this is when we release the first full draft of the report for public comment uh, and peer review. I strongly encourage all of you here to uh, take a look at that draft report when it comes out this fall and to submit public comments. Your comments really help strengthen the science of the report. They make sure we're clearly communicating uh, specific and actionable messages and they make sure that the report meets your needs and the needs of your stakeholders. Which brings me to my last slide here about who can access and use the information in the National Climate Assessment. I am often asked who is the audience of the National Climate Assessment and our standard answer is decision makers. Uh, but of course the term decision makers encompasses a lot of people, a lot more than what I've got on this slide. Um, but you can see here some of the decision makers at state and local levels, across the federal government, in uh, adaptation planning, in the research community. Uh, we know that the National Climate Assessment is used by journalists in the media, by educators developing curriculum, by nurses and farmers and utility managers. So it is a, uh, a real challenge to write something that can be useful to so many different people with so many different needs who are facing different climate threats around the country. Uh, but it is also an honor to be working on something so valuable uh, to people all around the country. Um, so with that, I will end. I hope I've interested you uh, enough to lend your expertise to our upcoming public comment period and maybe even inspired you to be a part of uh, future NCAs. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, I'll just emphasize, I'm looking forward uh, serving on one of the chapters to hearing uh, this, this uh, community's comments as well too. So please, please do engage. Allison, by the way, I don't know if you realize it, you knocked out two of the questions that were in the chat as well too in your presentation. So great work, uh, but we'll come back to some other questions as well. All right, moving along. Narrowing down the, 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 the geographic scope even more, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Neil Makuda from the California uh, Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Uh, Neil is the program manager for California's fifth climate change assessment uh, in the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. In this role, Neil oversees state level coordination between his office, the California Strategic Growth Council, California Department of Natural Resources, uh, and the California Energy Commission. Um, so before this role, he was the local government climate adaptation planning liaison 
at the state's Air Resources Board, where he developed resources for supporting community climate action planning. Uh, with that, Neil, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the, the kind of introduction. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Neil Matuka. I'm the program manager for California's fifth climate change assessment in the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research. I'm excited to be here with you all today to talk about some of the great work we're doing in California, integrating the best available science into climate adaptation and state and local action. Now, I, I do want to give a caveat that, that please keep in mind that this is only a brief snapshot of all of the incredible work that's going on at agencies across the state. Some important background on how we approach climate adaptation. Uh, I'm part of the California Governor's Office of Planning and Research uh, in the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resilience Program, or ICARP. ICARP was created in 2015 by Senate Bill 246 and works to advance the vision of a climate resilient California for all. ICARP has four components, a technical advisory council, an adaptation clearinghouse, the California Climate Change Assessment, and climate adaptation planning grants. <laughs> Our technical advisory council brings together local government, practitioners, scientists, and community leaders to help coordinate activities that better prepare California for the impacts of a changing climate. The TAC supports OPR in its goal to facilitate coordination among state, regional, and local adaptation and resiliency efforts with a focus on opportunities to support local implementation actions that improve the quality of life for present and future generations. This background is important because I wanna place the climate assessment in California in the context of our integrated climate action framework. We work with the other California state agencies to ensure that our processes are complementary and fill specific need. In this case, the climate assessment provides the research and data necessary to successfully address future climate impact. And we're lucky to be building on a long history of California assessment, starting with the first climate impact report from the Energy Commission in 1989. <clears throat> but since 2006, at the direction of Executive Order S305, the state has completed four comprehensive climate change assessments designed to assess the impacts and risks from climate change to inform policy actions. The first two assessments focus on understanding climate change and statewide impacts. The third and fourth assessments begin to examine the nuances of regional impact. With the passage of Senate Bill 1320 in 2020, California's fifth climate change assessment is now underway, building on the strength and closing some of the gaps of previous assessments. And there's some key updates to the climate change assessment process. Uh, with, the, with the passage of Senate Bill 1320, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research is now the interagency coordinator of the fifth assessment in partnership with the California Natural Resources Agency, California Energy Commission, and California Strategic Growth Council. We do also want to highlight all the work other state agencies have put into supporting previous assessments and developing the fifth assessment framework and working with us moving forward. We've hired a dedicated team to oversee the administration and rollout of the fifth assessment and have funding to support the development of an extensive suite of cutting edge research on climate change in California. And I do wanna note, this is, a, this is a major change because previous assessments, along with many other assessments at the state level, are not always funded and they're not always done by the state government. So we've moved from a quasi volunteer um, ad hoc arrangement between different agencies to being a fully funded entity. Now here you can also see our overall timeline for the five-year cycle of the fifth assessment. And I'm gonna walk you through some, each of the pieces, but I wanted to draw your attention to the public engagement component along the top of the timeline. Public engagement is a key component of the fifth assessment. And it's crucial to making sure that the research and tools produced through the assessment support effective action for everyone. The fifth assessment is not a single report, but rather a process comprising a number of programs and deliverables that include downscale climate projections and data, including climate scenarios such as wildfire and hydrologic modeling. 
original climate research specific to California, a tribal research program, which will include a tribal advisory group comprised of representatives from California tribes to guide the tribal research program, a tribal research grant program, integration of traditional knowledges and tribal expertise into fifth assessment reports as is culturally appropriate, and a tribal synthesis report that will assess climate impacts to tribal communities statewide. We'll also have regional and topical reports that synthesize the climate projections data and original climate research into a series of reports that will call attention to either particular topics of interest, such as the tribal report and an equity and environmental justice report, or summarizing the climate impacts on a particular geographic region. Climate planning and adaptation, climate planning and visualization tools, such as CalAdapt visualizations and the new CalAdapt analytics engine for computational and analytic support. And finally, a statewide summary report, which will be developed to highlight major findings and lessons learned throughout the assessment. And now I do also want to note that this statewide summary report is generally what folks refer to when they talk about our climate, our California climate assessment, but it does in fact refer to all of these pieces, many of which have different groups that, that are particularly invested. The data is made available, uh, regional reports are especially important to folks who live in those regions as they provide a more nuanced uh, discussion of, of their climate impact specific to their region and really offer an opportunity for the community to be involved in what are the impacts that they are most invested in and what research needs to be done to, to help them guide their adaptation and resilience planning efforts. Talking a little bit more about the data and visualizations, we also work to make sure that the data and those projections produced by the climate assessment are available for anyone across the state. This means it is posted publicly on our CalAdapt website with visualizations and tools for use by communities and planners, as well as making the data and projections themselves available for use in projects such as our state hazard mitigation planning, wildfire modeling, facility vulnerability assessments, and many more. And building on many of the results of the assessments, the State Adaptation Clearinghouse is a database of information and resources to assist decision makers at the state, regional, and local levels when planning for and implementing climate adaptation projects to promote resiliency across California. It's a searchable online database of case studies, tools and data, scientific studies, example plans and projects, and more which can all be filtered by climate impact or sector. And we also, because it, we recognize that, that there are many barriers to the implementation of everything that we, we are talking about in terms of, of the research and the data and the projections, we have funding, uh, funding programs. And there are numerous funding programs across state agencies that incorporate climate action and adaptation, but ICARP itself has three grant programs that support climate adaptation and resilience. Our adaptation planning grant program, our regional resilience planning and implementation grant program, and our upcoming extreme heat and community resilience program. Additionally, uh, some examples of how we are working to integrate climate research across the state include Executive Order N19, N19, which requires the redoubling of the state's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate the impacts of climate change while building a sustainable, inclusive economy. This focuses on investment, transportation, state building and operations, and zero emission vehicles. ICARP also supports additional cross-sector programs, such as the California Climate Risk Disclosure Advisory Group, a public-private partnership to develop common climate risk disclosure standards. So thank you. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to present the work that we're doing. I do want to remind everyone that this is really in the early planning stages and, and much of it is very flexible, especially as we engage more with our partners and determine what their needs are. Uh, but I do welcome you to reach out with additional questions and comments. You can reach us at climateassessment at opr.ca.gov or reach out to me directly. Um, and for even more information, please visit our website at climateassessment.ca.gov. That website hosts all of the fourth assessment data and, and research. 
Um, and that will be updated as soon as we start producing the new uh, research and data from the FIP assessment. Uh, you can also visit the Governor's Office of Planning and Research at opr.ca.gov. Thank you, Neil. We appreciate it. And I just, on, on just, I, I just want to recognize the role that the state of California plays as well, too, in providing leadership, not just in technical resources as well, too, for the, this type of work as well, um, both in my research and just, we turn to it a lot nationally as well, too. And so um, I think we appreciate that the role that your specific role, but also that the state is doing as well, too, among the, other, the efforts across the other states. So thank you. Um, all right, we'll go on to uh, our last speaker, our last panelist right now, John, uh, John Balbus. Um, John Balbus is the interim director of the new uh, Office of Climate Change and Health Equity at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, John also is the HHS principal for the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Uh, small, small community here. Um, uh, before initiating the new office, John served as the senior advisor for public health to the director of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Um, John is a physician and public health professional who's focused on the health implications of climate change for over 25 years. So John, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, I've been having audio problems and I'm on my phone. So could somebody give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? You sound great, John. Great, okay, thanks everybody. And uh, let me just echo the, the thanks to you, Chris, and to Lori and, and Jennifer Token and, and everybody and, and my fellow panelists for, for setting up this panel on a really important topic. Uh, I'm honored to be part of it, honored to be the, the last speaker. I think I'm the last speaker, uh, not just because I'm probably the, the most, uh, the least interesting speaker, but also because I'm a bit of a recovered assessor. Um, having having been involved in, in the last three national climate assessments and to some extent in the uh, I think it was the fifth assessment report with Bill um, uh, of the uh, IPCC. Uh, I'm now in, in in a new in a new frame, and and, and part of what um, the country as a whole is doing under the Biden administration, but um, also a little belatedly, the health sector as a whole is doing is making the pivot from assessment and research to action. And so I'm going to be speaking about how our office. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to, to share how how um, how our office is looking at this issue, you know, a little overview of the office, how we're approaching the issue of, of the evidence base for action for health resilience to climate change. And then hopefully we can do a little bit of a group think uh, with this incredible audience that we have to, to share, you know, what is the best way to take the assessments that exist and to build to them. I was very struck by Neil's showing of, of the, the fifth climate assessment of California as a bit of a mosaic with a lot of different components because there isn't a single kind of approach that gets us the evidence base and the kind of information we need to motivate action, which as you all know, has to be at, at kind of a hyper-local scale. So, um, you know, our office is kind of, that's why I say connecting global to local. Our, our office, as you'll see, is operating at a global scale in some ways, but the mission we have is very much local and hyper-local. And so my comments will be addressing the use of assessments to be able to build the evidence base and to guide those kind of hyper-local actions. So, so this is our starting place. And um, this is a, a, a dramatic photo. I'm sure all of you in the disaster um, world have seen this. And I, I raised it for, for two reasons. The first is that we're making this pivot to action at a time for the health sector when they are stretched in, fragmented, half the workforce gone, out of money, burned out. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough time to motivate things like decarbonization and, you know, facility hardening um, at a time when, uh, you know, people are stretched so thin and, and the finances are stretched so thin. And so we have to have the good evidence base. We have to have the, the, the best information to work on to be able to convince people who are questioning what is this climate change thing, why do we have to deal with it? The, the second thing that's obvious to everybody in the audience, I think that this, this picture kind of drives home so dramatically to me is, is that you know, climate change and health equity part is not a single topic, it's not an isolated topic, but that when we think about health equity and social justice and the world that we live in now, we have to be taking an all hazards approach and whatever we do from and off the climate change and health equity 
has to be thoroughly embedded, not just in all hazards, disaster management, and disaster preparedness, but also all people health equity. Uh, and, and so that's, the, that's, that's part of the approach that we're taking. Um, and, you know, of course, it wasn't just the Napa fire that um, showed us that, that these uh, that pandemics and climate risks can coexist at the same time. Um, the last couple of years of the COVID pandemic have really been one coincidence of a serious, uh, in some cases, unprecedented climate-related disaster after another. Um, you know, and not only has the weather impeded the delivery of care and the vaccination programs and the testing programs, et cetera, especially in 2020 as we were ramping up, but um, as all of you in the audience know, uh, the COVID pandemic has made it really hard to, to take people in, in, in tornadoes and hurricanes and heat waves and cram them into indoor spaces to make them safe when those indoor spaces can be settings for, uh, for, for um, disease transmission. So it's, that's the world that we're having to, to, to navigate in. Um, and again, as we've talked about, it's a world in which the ramifications of historic injustice are just clear to us in a way they have not been in, in recent history, in part because of the COVID pandemic and the tragic disproportionate burden of death and illness experienced by people in frontline occupations and people just in general uh, in, in lower income communities and, and, and historically marginalized and historically disadvantaged communities. And so we know that whatever assessments we're doing, whatever actions we're taking, as, as Bill started off, they have to be done with a recognition of the history and a recognition of the starting place and uh, an eye to not just this is where the attention has to be paid. These are the people that, you know, have ha, are bearing the greatest burden and need the resources to go to them, but also what works. Also, what is the evidence-based for action? What is the evaluative research? What's the implementation science research to know that in a resource-poor world, uh, that the investments that we're making are gonna have the impact that we want them to. So with that as a bit of a frame, uh, I, let me just tell you a little bit about our office. We are one of the um, manifestations of Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Uh, we were one of these three uh, well, we're actually all of these three mandates given to the Department of Health and Human Services. The first was to create the office, and then um, the other two tasks have been delegated to our office to stand up a new working group uh, to decrease the risk of climate change to children, uh, the elderly people with disabilities and the vulnerable, and also to stand up a new biennial health care system readiness advisory council. Um, the executive order was January 2021. Our office came into being at the end of August 2021, and in November of 2021, we found ourselves as the first ever Department of Health and Human Services official delegation to a conference of parties meeting, the, the UN climate change meeting. Um, and this is a photograph of, of the Assistant Secretary of Health, Admiral Rachel Levine, um, in Glasgow with Maria Nero, the head of the WHO uh, Climate and, and Environment Division, and the permanent UN representative from Fiji committing the United States to a health program, the COP26 health program. And I, I, I mentioned that prominently. Um, we made the commitments that you see at the bottom of the slide there to, to a resilient health system and also resilient communities and also low carbon health systems. Um, but the, the, the requirements or the commitments that we made were to actually do a vulnerability and adaptation assessment so a VNA in climate parlance or an NCA in, in GCRP parlance, and to create a, a national adaptation plan for health. Um, and so I want to talk about how we're approaching those two things. Um, I don't have time to go into to, to all of the ways in which our office is trying to harness the focus of the health sector in general on health equity and improving the social determinants of health. We heard uh, um, uh, our, our, our first speaker from FEMA talking about the connection between resilience and the social determinants of health. Um, but this is how we divide our work. Um, 
into three priority areas. The first priority area being that community resilience, um, our primary mission to protect the health of those bearing the greatest burden of, of health disparities and climate risks uh, and protecting them from impacts of climate change. The second priority area is, is harnessing climate actions to ad address upstream social determinants of health um, in, in all their manifestations. And the third is work specifically with the health sector to decarbonize the health sector and to make it more resilient. So we were, when we were first approached about joining the COP26 health program, uh, my, my thought was, well, of course, this is a no-brainer. We've already done an HNAP. We've already done a VNA. We're done. We, we, you know, we can say, raise our hands, say, yes, we're going to do it, and then we can hand in and say, we've already done it. Um, so, so this is the starting point, and these are actually my slides to the side event that we did in Glasgow. So our first deliverable, uh, as, our, as our first deliverable for the vulnerability and adaptation assessment, um, we used as a starting point the, the regionalization of the fourth national climate assessment for health that the CDC did preparing for the health impacts of climate change, regional impacts of climate change on health in the United States. Um, and, and this was a great assessment. It, it breaks up the, the information in the NCA. Part of it comes in regions, part of it comes in big chapters. It regionalized it all to say, you know, what are the threats in the 10 um, GCRP NCA regions? And then it linked it up with examples of what health departments were doing in each of those regions. And then for our national adaptation plan, we were able to use as a starting point the new um, climate action plan, actually they're now called climate adaptation and resilience plans um, for the Department of Health and Human Services, um, which this version was uh, had a big placeholder in it um, for um, our office and our mandate to actually work across all of HHS. So if you look at this action plan, the first priority here is the expansion of existing programs at CDC and NIH. The second priority is that the rest of HHS is going to get on board. And so that's what our office has taken on, the get on board stage for the rest of HHS. And again, for that, we have to have an evidence base to move a department that has been not motivated highly up to this point to take climate change as part of its core mission. So here's some of the detail of, of how we, we plan to do this. This is a super busy slide, um, but in terms of the vulnerability and adaptation assessment, we are very much using a similar approach to the California approach, which is a mosaic. Um, I sometimes call it pixelated because the information we need is partly the information that comes from national scale modeling or state level modeling, but it's partly the information that comes from conversations with people on street corners. And there's been a lot of those conversations. There's been a lot of stakeholder outreach. Every agency has done tons of stakeholder outreach and you can't go online and find it. So part of what we're trying to do is to compile what has been done, what are the conversations, what are the plans, and ask the question about adaptation gaps because that's the action plan for our office, right? If we're doing fine, then we don't have to do much as our office, but it's the gaps. And I think there probably will turn out to be a lot of gaps when it comes to protecting vulnerable populations from the health impacts of climate change. But we need to hear it from the bottom up as well as the top down. Um, and then for the national adaptation plan, uh, again, we are working one-on-one -on -one, sitting down with staff who have been um, dedicated from each of the divisions and creating divisional plans. And we're just at the stage now of collecting these divisional plans and trying to find the common grounds and create a, a, a synergy and a synthesis within HHS and hoping to deliver an HHS level comprehensive plan to, to COP27. And then for COP28, hoping that our uh, interagency working group that we were mandated, but we're not given any resources to create that we'll get resources, we'll create that, and that interagency working group will nationalize the adaptation plan for health in a, in a more substantial way. Um, I wanted to just share one example uh, as, we're, as we're going through there. There's, 
the, the literature that's out there, the, the assessments that have been done at the municipal level, at the state level, the assessments that the BRACE program or the CDC have done, um, all provide these pieces of the mosaic. Um, most municipalities take a slightly different approach. The municipal approach is different from the state approach. Um, and some of them actually look at what's missing uh, in the recommendations and, and what are the gaps and how to analyze these gaps. And this was one example of a study done by the CDC Foundation in Kresge, where they went to the local health departments and asked them, uh, you know, what, what did they need? And all the local health departments recognized that the locus of resilience is hyperlocal, that the community-based organizations or CBOs, which is what this slide is about, are kind of the, the, the fundamental building blocks of resilience within communities. Um, and then this report was looking at just the relationship between local health departments and CBOs and analyzing what were the root causes for failure to get together and how do we start to, to fix that. So this is the kind of space that our office is really focusing on and hopefully um, as, as we are uh, building our own capacity, we can start to make a difference not just for the health departments, which are really the purview of the CDC, but with other agencies bringing health and other resources to the community-based organizations. And um, one other thing I just wanted to share is uh, part of our, our, our strategy is to um, look at how well the federal government is coordinating these this braiding of resources. And I don't have time to talk about the framework of the theory behind this, but those of you who work with communities know that communities are the experts at getting the funds from FEMA and HRSA and, you know, CDC or, um, you know, HUD or DOT and finding the grants that can help to create programming at the local level to address their needs. Um, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. Often communities we hear uh, the communities most needing them have the hardest time accessing some of these funds. So our office is undertaking an evaluation from a health standpoint on how well the federal family is delivering at the local level. And we're doing this by uh, a paired approach. The first is to look at the regional headquarters across multiple federal agencies. These just happen to be the agencies of the GCRP. And we are planning a workshop where we'll discuss how the how well do the regional headquarters office, the, the NOAA regions, the EPA regions, the HHS, which has multiple types of regional offices, how well are they communicating um, within the Beltway? And then to, as much as we can, do deep dives so that we connect through using our HHS regional partners as, as a platform to, to have listening sessions where we connect vertically between the regions, the, the, the federal government through the regions, the states to the municipal, down to the community-based organization and community leaders to hear what's working, what's not. Starting to try to, to hear the voices and, 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 and get you know, as much firsthand information as we can compiled in different frontline communities around the country. So. Sorry, those are just my brackets, the, the horizontal and the vertical. So um, with that, let me just offer closing thoughts and then hopefully we save time for discussion. Um, you know, we've heard about the international assessments, the national assessments, the state assessments, there's a lot of municipal assessments. And, and clearly there are different types of actions. Some actions are just getting a state to invest or just getting a county to create a hub. And, and so the motivation to action um, is, is something that can often be done very well with a very high level assessment, with a national assessment. The kinds of key messages of the climate change are the federal government saying, you need to do something about the health impacts of climate change. Um, it can motivate action, but the type of action needed in a place for a specific group of people, by a specific group of people, requires also that bottom up. And so the challenge for a federal government is how do we how do we make that connection? How do we how do we support that? And especially, how do we move from understanding what the problems are to the next phase of what would be solutions to those problems and what are the gaps? Why is that not happening yet? So with that, I thank you. 
Um, I have one more slide, but I'm not advancing. Um, there it is. Uh, please um, visit us online, visit our listserv. There's a lot of resources that we already have, um, more coming out, uh, including a, a special seasonal forecast for health product that we have started in the last couple of months, and happy to take any questions at our office email as well. So thanks again. Thank you, John. Thanks, thanks to all the panelists. Quick clap for everyone. We really appreciate it um, sharing the information. I'm just going to jump into some. I think some of the really first of all, thank you, everyone. Great dialogue going on in there. I'm going to pick up on some of it, but I want to go back to an earlier question from way back. Bill, I'm going to direct this first to you, then kind of open it up to everyone. Um, let me just I'll state the question, then I'll kind of I, I have a spin on it as well too. So. Um, this is way back. So the, the comment was your note that, quote, climate change impacts cannot be ignored, end quote, is so true. And yet it often felt to the commenter feels though it is. The question was, who do you think the key players are that need to stop ignoring it? And so what you refer to climate change impacts that cannot be ignored. The commenter said it feels overwhelming as individuals and large corporations or entities seem to carry on as usual or expand their operations rather than make the drastic changes that are needed. So Bill, the first comment to you, but I kind of want to expand that to, uh, to others. All of you know you want your message of these assessments and your work to be going out to a set of stakeholders that perhaps you have a hard time reaching. Um, could you maybe reflect on that a little bit and your outreach and how you try and get to them? So, Bill, I'll start with you, please. Sure. And uh, that's, that's a tough question and no, no fair, but I guess, uh, um, you know, it's it's obviously a very poignant question. I, I guess my... Um, you know, and, and my thoughts are, are pretty simple. I mean, in some ways, um, there's a couple of things going on. One is, you know, at the individual level, in many cases, I find, you know, as a social scientist, you know, climate change is, you know, to, to really bring it to people's attention, often it is a lived experience, right? Um, either through uh, your, yourself or someone near in your, in your, in your sphere. Um, and I think that's, that's certainly a... Um, a really powerful uh, element. Um, in terms of those that are quote unquote ignoring it, I, I do feel, you know, again, uh, having just gone through one of these approval processes for the summary for policymakers, you know, there's pretty, you know, at some level there's widespread recognition of the problem and, 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 we, and, and the issues involved, but it's the politics that make, um, and the conditions, you know, centered around that, that, that oftentimes make it um, impossible to, um, to engage, right, or difficult to engage. And, um, you know, there's just, I mean, this is a really simple answer um, that if we can sort of try to understand better, uh, and uh, Laurie had the question about the role of social scientists. I mean, for the social scientists in the, in the group here, I mean, this is our moment, really. I mean, the physical scientists have, have contributed significantly, they will continue. But some of the underlying questions, back to you, Chris, is, you know, like, why are people ignoring it? I mean, these are, deeply embedded social science questions. It's beyond psych psychology, really. It's sort of the issues of, of vested interests, um, you know, political uh, differences, et cetera, um, at least from my perspective, limited as it might be, you know, that is uh, creating opportunities for people to ignore it. But that nonetheless, as you sift through it, you know, whether you're a Kansas farmer or you're, you know, someone on the streets of New York, it becomes a lived experience. Um, and that's when you really can't ignore it anymore. But any other panelists would like to jump in on that, feel free to jump in. Well, I liked the live experience oh, I... uh, um, answer. That was really good. Um, I Maybe I'll tie it back into another comment um, uh, in the chat. There were definitely um, a lot of interest in social science for the National Climate Assessment. We have more social scientists as authors this time around than we've ever had. We have a chapter on human uh, social systems for the first time. So you are seeing that, that, that um, rise and uh, you know, importance in the National Climate Assessment. Another comment talked about art. And I, I, I feel strongly that that's another way of reaching people uh, where they are and helping people put themselves in their own climate story so that when they have those lived experiences, they think, oh, this is climate change, um, that, that those two things aren't completely separated. 
And, and I'll support what everybody's saying, but as a, as a physician, public health person, I, I have a, a slightly different um, viewpoint on this. Um, you know, I, I, I see, of course, our office is taking on the mantle of trying to get doctors and nurses and the entire health sector to think that climate change is part of their issue. But I'm kind of dumbfounded, frankly, at the trouble that we've had getting people in the climate change space to think that health is part of their core issue. And I am, frankly, deeply disappointed, flabbergasted, dumbfounded to have seen the schedule of days for Sharm El Sheikh and COP27 and to note that, once again, health, there is no health day at COP27. Health is not one of the 11 most important things to have a day about. Um, I'm flabbergasted. I am dumbfounded that we have solid scientific evidence as put in the NCA4 as coming out every year that the health benefits that accrue, the economic benefits from the health benefits of reducing fossil fuel combustion more than cover the costs of the reductions themselves. Just the health benefits of fossil fuel reduction pay for climate change action in a line for example, with meeting the Paris Agreement. That seems to me to be a really important fact, and yet it's very hard to hear people who are at the very top levels of climate change policy leadership make a big point about that. So um, that's where we're trying to go and and, and trying to take a strong evidence base for both the work that Allison's done beautifully over years at EPA showing what are the what are the economic costs if you don't take action for health and how expensive that is bringing that over to the people who you know the, the number of counters and the bean counters and health you know because that's an important information but then this economic reality of the, the health benefits the, again it's not dollar for dollar we can talk about what does economic value mean but but the the, the valuation given to the saved lives more than pays for the action. That's where we're trying to go. Off soapbox. And I just wanted to add in really quickly that I, I think this is one of the areas that, um, you know, hoping we can really improve on, you know, from my experience doing climate action planning, you know, when you, when you look at say local government implementation of the types of mitigation and adaptation strategy that we want to see, I think it was, Allison was in her presentation. It's not about reducing greenhouse gas emissions to local communities. It's about, are my kids going to have asthma? Can I sit outside in July during the day? You know, <laughs> is my house going to be washed away by, by the ocean? So we need to, you know, we have this underlying science, we have this underlying information, and it needs to be framed and messaged appropriately so that it resonates with people and that they're able to be on board and suggest uh, actions that align with their values and but that meet the needs of their community and the broader need for action. So I'm gonna, Neil, I'm gonna keep you up next on the next question. Just Neil and Allison and then others feel free to jump in. So you had a nice dialogue going in the chat about, so the last question was about which stakeholders that we have a hard time getting through to. Now I wanna ask about your consultations or your engagement with perhaps folks that should have had a voice at the table for a long time and are, we're starting to now or trying to do better about that. Uh, underrepresented groups, um, Allison, I'm thinking about like the youth engagements, youth and EJ engagements, which I'll, real quick, I'll note, I was sitting in on some of those. Those were some of the most invigorating and energizing sessions I've had, kind of the inspirational why we do the work we do type sessions. And so, Neil, let's go to you first. How, like, I know you mentioned like tribal consultations and engagement as well to Allison, like talking about how NCA has grown. Can you just speak more about that, about how you are trying to, and your programs are trying to make sure that these voices that are loud actually are heard as well too, um, as part of your assessment processes? Yeah, thank you. And, and this is a huge component of the new assessment and, and why it's so exciting that it was codified in legislation this time around and, and that it includes funding, um, partly because, it, you know, just putting out previous assessments did the best that they could do with the limited funding and time and, and people that they had available. But what that meant was it was done as could be done, as agencies had resources, as staff had extra time to devote, 
And then for a lot of the work that was done by volunteers outside of the state, a lot of the reports were written by volunteers. And what that means is it defers to people who have the time and the privilege and the expertise and they know someone. So this time around, we have, we have funding for our products. Um, we have a five-year cycle and we, we've integrated more consultation and, and engagement into the entire process. And what that means for us is that we're looking to make sure that authors who are outside of the usual group are able to participate. We're not going to exclude people because they were previous authors. That's a valuable source of information. We want to make sure that, that folks who need funding to participate are able to because we value their expertise and we value their experience and they have something to add. We're making sure that uh, the community process is incorporated into our programs now because we're able to fund, say, the development of regional reports. We're able to provide funding so that they can do community workshops, they can have community technical advisory groups, they can work with NGOs and other leaders in the space to make sure that the community has a voice and the different groups have voices in shaping the product so that they actually reflect their needs and they reflect their vision. Um, there are some, some more specific cases, like we are going to have an equity and environmental justice uh, report. We're also going to have a tribal report. Um, and especially in those two instances with the tribal report, recognizing that our tradition, well, our, our Western science-based approach that has been the norm for, for many, many years is not the only way of knowing things. Um, but the, because of the systemic processes that we've engaged with in, in the past and outside of the assessments themselves, that we are providing the resources and the space that we're doing, we're offering the ability to do government to government consultation in a formal capacity. We're offering informal consultation. We're offering listening sessions. We are, we are taking a, a whole of government approach where we're working with tribal liaisons from other, other agencies as well uh, to, to incorporate into their work. Um, we're providing funding for the tribal advisory group um, so that we're not leading to additional burnout uh, when we ask folks for, for their input. Um, and we have additional contracts to support that type of work. And we have a grant program that will support that local climate research and, and capacity so that tribes in this, in this instance, tribes specifically, have the ability to participate. Um, and we're trying to, you know, so that's an example of one of a very specific silo of, of the assessment, um, but making sure that we're listening early and often and building that engagement and, and those feedback loops into all of our processes so that we can, we can make sure that this isn't just a report that sits on the shelf. I have a sec to add on real quick. Uh, I, I can't top that answer because I think uh, what Neil described is a, a model to other states as well as to the national assessment. It's an incredible level of engagement. Um, so I will focus, uh, I'll, I'll highlight one thing happening at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy level, which is the development of uh, guidance on the use of indigenous knowledge across the federal government in assessments, but in other um, activities, um, rules and regulations and reports that happen at a federal level, which is in a, um, uh, go, probably gonna go out for public comment, I believe this fall. So that's another thing to look for um, that I think will make a really big difference in informing uh, many people across the federal government how to make sure we're doing a better job uh, reaching uh, all of these people and getting all of these voices involved. Thanks, Allison. So I'll be real brief. Just thank you again to our panelists in the center for, for inviting us. Um, to the last topic, one of the reasons I was interested in holding this session was to bring, to make sure we all had a chance to uh, share the work uh, of these assessments and to share with this audience and this community. We know many of you are using it, but many of you may, may not as familiar with it as well, too. And so this is part of that process as well, too. So hopefully you've all taken away uh, a little more familiarity of what, what, what we're all doing. So with that, thank you everyone. Lori, I'll turn it over to you for comments and close, close us out, please. Chris, just I, I still remember the moment I met you at the Hazards Workshop in Colorado and thank you for just immediately 
jumping on this opportunity to bring this panel together to open this workshop up with this plenary panel. Thank you to you. Thank you, Neil, John, Bill, Allison, and to Victoria for the recorded comments. And thank you for the knowledge and information that you shared with us. And most of all, thank you for sharing the opportunities that are still available for members of this community and those who we study, serve, work with on a daily basis to get involved. And so thank you so much. And everyone who is still on here. Um, just a couple of closing announcements before we move to a 90-minute lunch break. And so first and foremost, today before 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, if you would please go to the link hazards.colorado.edu forward slash form 22. And I see Mufti put that in the chat. Thank you, Mufti. And please, there's one question that we're asking everybody at the workshop this year to answer that's going to feed into to the workshop community mural that the ever talented Elise Birnbach is going to be creating for us. So please take one minute to respond to that one question today before 5 p.m. Also, after you have lunch or do whatever you need to do during your break, we hope you will come back at 1.30 p.m. Mountain Time for uh, and select between three book forums that we have set up today. You're going to have the opportunity to meet the authors of Underwater, Tales from an Uncertain World, and Disasterology, and to hear from the authors as well as from a panel who have read the books. So don't worry if you haven't read the books. Uh, you're going to learn about the books, but we're also going to hear from some book clubs who have read the books with some questions. So please come back, be with us at 1.30, and then we'll have afternoon concurrent sessions after that. And then this evening, we and throughout the remainder of the workshop, we hope you will go to Feed Loop, go to the workshop uh, posters portal, and visit the 60 plus amazing posters that we have up there. And also please visit the editor's portal and go and meet some editors of book series and journals that are publishing work in this field and ask questions, make connections. And with that, we hope that you have a restful and restorative break. And we'll look forward to seeing you back in 90 minutes. Again, huge thanks to this plenary panel and thanks to all of you. Take care. <laughs>